We have a lunch program also. So while you are all, um, I hope, getting ready to have some coffee and dessert, it's my pleasure to introduce to you now the, our, our, our lunch program. The ITA's Academic Council has an interesting and very useful project, which is called Preserving Perspectives. It is a project to interview leading arbitrators regarding the development and evolution of international arbitration. This has led to a series of wonderful videos, actually, that are posted on ITA's website. These videos are, are a tremendously rich resource, and um, I encourage you to check them out on ITA's website. And I'm now delighted to introduce to you the next interview uh, in this important series, Professor and member of our Academic Council, uh, Catherine Rogers, will be interviewing Professor Rusty Park. And allow me to introduce both of them to you briefly. Professor Catherine Rogers, her scholarship focuses, as many of you may know, on international arbitration and professional ethics. She teaches at Penn State Law and has been appointed Professor of Ethics, Regulation, and the Rule of Law at Queen Mary University of London, where she is also co-director of the Institute for Ethics and Regulation. Her book, Ethics in International Arbitration, was recently published by Oxford University Press and is the leading scholarly treatment of this important subject. She is a reporter for the American Law Institute's restatement of the U.S. Law of International Commercial Arbitration, and she co-chairs, together with Professor Park, the uh, ICA Queen Mary Task Force on third-party funding in international arbitration. She is also the founder and director of Arbitrator Intelligence, which is an a nonprofit organization developing informational resources to increase transparency, fairness, and accountability in the arbitrator selection process. And I encourage all of you, if you have not done so already, to go to www.arbitratorintelligence.org. Already a lot of very uh, fascinating information uh, you'll see on that website. Professor Rusty Park is Today, one of the world's leading arbitrators without question. He is also among the most prolific and important writers in our field. His scholarship is always insightful and his written work is a particularly rich resource for all of us in this field. He is a professor of law at Boston University. He is the general editor of Arbitration International and a former president of the London Court of International Arbitration. He has held visiting academic appointments in Cambridge, Dijon, Hong Kong, Auckland, and Geneva. He is a member of ICA's <coughs> governing board. <clears throat> he served as arbitrator on the Claims Resolution Tribunal for Dormant Swiss Accounts and the International Commission on Holocaust-Era Insurance Claims. He was appointed to ICSID's panel of arbitrators uh, and his books include some of the most important uh, treatises also in our field. Um, uh, they include a number, uh, the ones that uh, many of you are most uh, familiar with, I suspect, are Arbitration of International Business Disputes, International Forum Selection. He is the Park in the Craig Park and Paulson <laughs> of Arbitration of, inter of, uh, uh, of ICC Arbitration, a very important treatise. Uh, and he is the park in Reisman, Craig Park, and Paulson's uh, uh, International Commercial Arbitration, two very important and highly, uh, uh, very well uh, used uh, treatises. Uh, well, without further ado, I will leave you to our two good professors, uh, and we look forward very much to this interview. Thank you both. Well, this is truly a, a pleasure for me, and I think will be for you as well. Uh, Rusty, in addition to all the accolades that were acknowledged, has been a friend, a mentor, a, a colleague, and a collaborator uh, for many, many years. So I feel very privileged to be the person asked to interview him for this. Uh, it's also a privilege because I, uh, in preparing for this interview, was able to learn a lot more about Rusty uh, than I had ever known, and I think we have something of a treat in store for you. 
you. So you just uh, heard, I think, a, <clears throat> that's probably just a snapshot of his professional accomplishments. We're going to take you back to the beginning, uh, to before the Rusty we all know today, uh, to the very beginning. Uh, he was born uh, in uh, Philadelphia, but actually grew up in Cassett, Massachusetts, uh, which is a small village on the way to Cape Cod. And you still live there. And uh, as I understand, just recently hosted a, uh, your high school reunion there. Okay. But we want to go back before high school um, and uh, see the time when you distinguished yourself do we have the slides going? Let's see. This is a dramatic pause as you all wait to see what I'm about to reveal here. Very much worth the wait. So, uh, Rusty, this is, I, I assume, one of the local pastimes in Cohasset. Yes, that was my first achievement. And <laughs> The, the thing that's interesting about that fish, which I caught at four and a half years old, is that my grandmother arranged to cook dinner for eight people, including <laughs> my great-grandfather and some neighbors and an uncle. And uh, of course, she'd sent my grandfather out to the store to buy some cod, but she pretended that it all came from that little miraculous fish which to my small four and a half year old brain seemed quite normal. <laughs> Maybe that's what set you uh, on your road for big aspirations uh, and accomplishments. So in addition, we know that you also went to high school there and we were able to find actually a picture of you on your way to the high school prom. That's right, I was 17 at the time and my date was somewhat exotic because she did not come from Cohasset. She came from a town called East Bridgewater, which was about 10 miles away. And it was rather daring for anyone to show up at the prom with someone from a different village. So I guess that was my first step toward internationalism, uh, going, out of, going out of my local parish. <laughs> Okay, so but actually became international very quickly and much more adventurous because one of the important pieces in your identity, really, uh, is your time in the Navy as a midshipman. And I think we also have uh, an image of that. And in can everybody pick out who they think Rusty is there? I'll give you a second. We don't vote on this, but here we are. Okay, so can you tell us about... Did I get the right one? Well, that was... Uh that was when the midshipmen were all in Pensacola at uh, a, uh, an air training. Um, it was a very important uh, experience. And as I think I said to Catherine, one of the things that I took away from it was the importance of teamwork and the importance of uh, collegiality, working together. Um, Every week, people will call me up and talk about a particular individual or two or more particular individuals as possible arbitrators. And sometimes they will say, well, I think he's or she's very clever. And my response is often, well, clever is good, but uh, having sound judgment and a collegial spirit is even better. Um, and that's one of the things that I remember being very important in the Navy. And also the Navy sort of facilitated uh, some of your international study, right? So you went to Yale and Columbia, but then also studied in Paris at the Sorbonne. And at that time, it was quite fashionable to travel uh, on the Queen Mary. Yeah, I have no idea who that girl was. I just remember <laughs> that uh, as I was getting on the ship, uh, she commandeered me to carry her suitcase. What, what you will see under the right arm is first of all a guitar, and people still have guitars today. The other <laughs> is my portable typewriter. And my guess is that there are some people in the younger generation who may never have seen a typewriter <laughs> except in an ethnographic museum of some sort. Okay. But we all traveled with portable typewriters in those days. Well, she looks quite happy to have you carrying her bag, I'll have to say. Uh, so with that, uh, while you were in Paris, uh, you, as a young man, engaged in activities that seem appropriate for a young man in France, including 
we have here uh, riding at the Forêt de, de Fontainebleau. Fontainebleau. The horse did all the work, the heavy okay. lifting. <laughs> so to speak. Okay. Uh, and uh, now, again, uh, you know, to take us back to Paris, uh, you happened to be there in the May 1968 protests uh, that shook France uh, when Charles de Gaulle was still president. And we also have a picture of that with you doing something rather unusual. Uh, say, can anyone pick out Rusty in this picture? It's interesting is when they hire you, even to be a, <coughs> uh, a teaching fellow at a college, they give you a Cambridge degree. So you get a <laughs> master's at the same time you become a member of the faculty. So just to, just to sum up here, did you, at this point, 1975, did you already know you were going to go into international arbitration or still an I, unknown in your I had future? no idea. Oh, okay. At the time, I wanted to be a tax lawyer and uh, uh, in fact, I'm still a tax lawyer. It's one of the courses I teach. Um, arbitration was just an accident. And as I think I told uh, Catherine, uh, it all happened. Uh, it was a hot day in August when I was back practicing in Paris uh, at the same firm as Paul Clemenceau, in fact. And I think I was probably the only associate in the firm stupid enough to be sitting in his apartment on a hot afternoon in August and the second senior partner of the firm called me up and said, uh, get on a train and go down to Toulon. We have a client who's in a dispute with the shipyard down there. The shipyard wants them to take possession of two giant LNG carriers. And I went down there and found that under the French judicial system, these sorts of disputes are decided normally by uh, commercial courts. And the commercial courts are presided over by lay judges. Well, this lay judge was a paint merchant. And guess who his biggest customer was? It was, of course, the shipyard, which was one of the two sides to the uh, dispute. And I was intrigued by the, the technical stuff in the case, which had to do with whether these ships were finished and completed according to specifications. But I kept trying to get from the uh, client a copy of the contract. And finally, after a week, they gave me a copy of the contract. And I go through to the end of it. And there is a clause that says ICC arbitration in Paris. <laughs> and we were able to get the case removed from the Toulon paint merchant and sent to arbitration. And in the end, it settled. And that was my first lesson in uh, the real raison d'etre for international arbitration, which is to enhance a level playing field, to augment neutrality and predictability. Okay. So let's take a deeper look, shall we, at the, your time in Paris, which was actually quite an interesting time. And you were keeping some very interesting company. Uh, we have a picture here I'm, that I understand you took. Uh, and people might not be able to recognize who's in it. Uh, so maybe you can tell us who that is. Well, there are three people, all of whom are very uh, uh, illustrious in different ways. Uh, on the right was my then girlfriend, Martine. On the left is Bruno de Fumichon, who is a professor of legal history in Paris. And in the middle, that's Jan Paulson, uh, <laughs> when he still had black hair and a mustache. And we were having breakfast uh, in our apartment. Uh, I am featured on the wall, and that on the back there you see a little picture, and that's me when I was visiting a cabin up in Sweden. So uh, let's just t talk a little bit more about uh, your relationship with these two, because uh, it's perhaps not by accident that you ended up uh, collaborating with them on the scholarly and other professional endeavors. So for those of you who don't know, Paul, Jan Paulson is the Paulson in the Craig Park and Paulson book. Um, but um, the, uh, uh, let's see, and uh, Bruno is a legal historian with whom you've also collaborated. Um, can you tell us a little about those academic collaborations? Well, Bruno and I are right now working on a long article about the Alabama arbitration, which some of you may know. It's the 1872 arbitration in Geneva that settled the claims by the United States against Great Britain for outfitting some Confederate raiders that did great damage to Union shipping during the American Civil War. And uh, we're looking in particular at the role of the dissident uh, British arbitrator, Sir Alexander Coburn, 
Um, and it's going to be, I think, a very fun and interesting piece. Uh, Jan and I have worked together on a number of projects over the years. And I think you have another picture of Jan, don't you? I was going to bring uh, that up now. Here's there, another. That's the same group, but uh, no longer at breakfast. And Bruno has his shirt uh, buttoned up. <laughs> uh, and Jan and I uh, have worked together on different projects, including Craig Park and Paulson, which is about to go into its fourth edition. Exactly. So how did that uh, come about? Because actually, that was really, uh, it was first published, I had to look this up, in 1984. Uh, and this is my personal assessment, so I, uh, perhaps can be corrected. But I think it was the first uh, international arbitration treatise published, keeping in mind Redfern and Hunter, also very distinguished, but was first published in 1986. Uh, but that did happen to be a time when you were also, in addition to pioneering uh, in international arbitration studies, also climbing other mountains. Yeah, that was a, a very interesting excursion in Switzerland because the guide who took me up to the top of the Rimpfershorn spoke only Swiss German. And my <laughs> German is not the best, but in any event, I did get up and back. <laughs> That's great. So, and we also look forward very much to the, to the new edition of Craig Park and Paulson. So with that uh, sort of more personal background, I'd like to now turn to some of your reflections looking back on your career. Um, and I'm going to start with, with uh, something that's a little more uh, provocative or, or, or um, a challenging. Uh, people don't necessarily always want to think about. People have said repeatedly now um, that the golden age of international arbitration is over. Uh, and I wanted to know from you, do you agree? Um, or what would be your view of that concern that people are expressing? My sense is that we are probably now in the golden age <laughs> of arbitration. I mean, it's true that there's a tendency to be nostalgic about a time 40 years ago when you had a few great men, and they were all great men at that time, who lived in an axis that went from London to Paris to Geneva. And they would do arbitration in a very quick and simple fashion. Uh, but what we now have is a lot uh, more challenges. For one thing, arbitration is more diverse. Uh, and a lot of the diversity relates to the people who are sitting on tribunals. So it's no longer the great men from Paris, London, and Geneva. You've got people from China, from Singapore, from Australia, from Latin America. Uh, and I could just keep going on. And this poses some uh, challenges in terms of the culture of arbitration. Because there are some places which have a very deep sense that document production is part of the arbitral process. Other places don't know document production. And one of the questions, of course, is if a lawyer receives a order from the arbitrators to produce certain documents, uh, how will that lawyer react? We have some sense in this room of how an American lawyer would react or how a British lawyer would react. But lawyers from different cultures may have different views. So I think that to some extent, we are now in a golden age in terms of challenges, in terms of opportunities. Uh, but at the same time, arbitration has become a victim of its own success in the sense that because it is so widely used for international dispute resolution, um, it's now easier for people to take a pot shot mm -hmm. at various things in arbitration uh, without thinking about what the alternative would be. So I don't think the golden age is gone. I think we're right in the middle of the golden age. OK, well, that's very optimistic. With that, let me take you to another set of questions that are, um, that are topical and that you have a unique perspective on uh, with regard to, uh, as a result of, <clears throat> excuse me, your being at the helm of the uh, LCIA. Um, so what would you see as the challenges that are specifically facing arbitral institutions um, and what would you say uh, that the role of institutions has evolved, or how have they evolved, in the last, say, 40 years, 30 years? Well, I think that one of the challenges that faces institutions, which also faces arbitral tribunals, mm -hmm. is dealing with the notion of efficiency. What is an efficient arbitration? Um, and uh, efficiency really has two different uh, aspects to it. You can talk about efficiency in a narrow sense, meaning going quickly and cheaply. 
But you can also talk about efficiency in the sense of uh, giving effective case management. And effective case management involves more than just going quickly and cheaply. It involves coming to a just result. It involves according due process. It involves uh, giving an award that's enforceable. And this involves a balancing. Uh, sometimes I say that the notion of efficiency is a little bit like uh, the notion of a good meal in a restaurant. <laughs> if you go to a restaurant and they serve you your food quickly and cheaply, but it's a bad meal, you're going to have an unsatisfactory <laughs> experience. Um, what I think institutions and tribunals are challenged in is coming to the right balance, and that is not easy. It involves uh, uh, weighing costs and benefits, and often, of course, we understand things going backwards, looking in uh, the past, but we've got to live life going forward. And I sometimes say that in connection with this whole notion of, of balance and counterpoise, um, I often think, going back to the Navy days, of a story told to me by a petty officer in the Navy. It was about a sailor who was pulling on a rope to try to hoist up some heavy equipment, and the pulley broke. And the sailor started to go higher and higher in the air because uh, the pulley was broken and the heavy equipment was pulling him up. And the petty officer shouted, uh, let go, let go. But the sailor was too terrified to let go. And so then the petty officer shouts, hold on, hold on, we'll come to get you. <laughs> and then the terrified sailor let go, and he fell and he broke both of his legs. And when he ended up in the hospital, the petty officer came and chatted with him at his bedside, and the sailor said, what did I do? And the petty officer said, you held on when you should have let go, and you let go when you should have <laughs> held on. <laughs> And part of the trick of being a good arbitral institution and a good arbitral tribunal is knowing when to hold on and when to let go. And this is far more of an art than a science. So that's a good segue to my next sort of combined uh, double question, which is what would you say are your greatest professional accomplishments, the ones that are, you're most proud of, that are most important to you? And what would you say have been your biggest... ...been changed or not? And on the... Uh, third day of the hearings, one of the chief witnesses for the claimants showed up. And as he sat down, it was sort of strange to me. There were certain blue uniformed police right next to the door of the hearing room. And they had not been there before. There were uh, eight of them. And so I had the sense that there was something up. And as he sat down, the lawyer for the respondent government asked the witness, Sir, do you know that in this country, perjury is an offense that is punishable by 25 years in prison? Witness said, I guess so. And do you know that in this country, forgery is an offense punishable by 30 years in prison? Okay. And at that point, the penny dropped, and I asked my co-arbitrators to come out of the room, because what was happening was the lawyer was going to ask him, did you change the date? And if he said yes, he'd be immediately arrested for forgery. And if he said no, he'd be immediately arrested for perjury. And although this all might be sorted out three years later, uh, he'd be in jail during that time, perhaps. And it was not a happy situation. So we went back to the uh, hearing room, and we asked, uh, you know, does your legal system have a privilege against self-incrimination? And one side, the claimant's lawyer said yes. The other side, the respondent said, we do, but it does not apply in arbitration. So it was pretty clear this guy was going to be arrested no matter what. And uh, we basically said to him, uh, you're dispensed from testifying. You can get on the plane going back to Paris. Um, and that's the type of thing that happens in the golden age of arbitration <laughs> because there is now such diversity and we're no longer arbitrating in London, Paris, and Geneva. We're arbitrating in places where people have a different sense of what's allowed in hearings. Okay. I, I like that because a lot of times people talk about arbitrators as if all they do is you know, produce outcomes. And in fact, it seems like such a, an important part, probably the most important part of what they do is manage the proceedings, especially when challenges like that come up. But you, 
you evaded the question of what your greatest uh, accomplishments are, what you're most proud of. So I want to take us back to that before we move on. Well, I wouldn't call them accomplishments. I'd call them perhaps gifts. One of the uh, things that uh, has been so wonderful about being in this job is sitting with excellent co-arbitrators. And I remember the first time I had a feeling, which I've had since that uh, time many, uh, many, many years ago, I was chairing my first large case and I was sitting with two uh, uh, top-notch arbitrators in the field, and I had the sense that this was just a unique privilege for me to be <laughs> learning from these two guys. Um, the case went on for a long time. There, it was a construction case, and there were 48 claims, plus a half a dozen counterclaims, and each side kept adding on more claims and counterclaims <laughs> as we went along. Eventually, the case took quite a while, and of course the parties complained that it took a while. They forgot that part of it was because they kept adding on claims and counterclaims. But uh, it's, it's a gift like that which uh, is, uh, um, is quite precious in international arbitration. They sit with two guys who really know what they're doing, and both of whom have remained friends. Mm. Well, that's nice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that's certainly one of the hallmarks of the community is that we have such talented and interesting people in it. Um, so, but one of the things that's interesting about your career is that in addition to being an arbitrator, uh, you've been a professor for many years and you've taught, I would guess, thousands and thousands of students. Uh, and you also, uh, as was provided in the introduction, you were just a prolific author. Um, how do you see these different activities fitting together? And, and also, where do you find the extra five hours in every day? I only get 24. So. Well, the the two activities, teaching and practice, are complementary, as, as uh, most people uh, can imagine. And they're complementary beyond just uh, giving the teacher some stories to tell the students. What I say now may seem to be uh, critical of my colleagues in academia. Uh, it's not intended to be, but I think that there is a tendency on the part of academics who do nothing but teach to talk with themselves. And if you have an argument with yourself, you're bound to win. <laughs> uh, when an academic goes into practice, the professor has to deal with people who have sometimes radically different ideas from hers or his, and has to confront those ideas uh, in, in a way that can sometimes uh, cause self-examination and re-evaluation or cherished beliefs. Um, one of the things that uh, disappoints me among some of my colleagues in academia, not all of them, is that when they confront an idea which they disagree with, they just go back into their offices, close the door, and that's the end of it. Whereas when you're in practice, you can't just close your door and go back to talking to yourself. So I think that uh, one, of the, one of the virtues of practice is that it uh, it refines scholarship. It makes you think about things you didn't think of before, and it makes you think that maybe you were incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had so many uh, uh, times over the last uh, 30, 35 years that I've looked at an idea that I wrote about back in 1983 or 84, and I said, you know, that was dumb. I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> back then. And this has led me sometimes to say, that I'm not an expert anymore. I'm a specialist. Specialist in the sense that it's what I do for a living. The last time I was an expert was back when I did my first arbitration. Then I knew it all. <laughs> uh, but since that time, I've realized that there are many ways of doing things. And so it's a little bit uh, uh, difficult, I think, for anyone to talk about uh, best practices in the absolute. There are some practices that are better or worse than others. Um, but as we go forward, uh, we really are reinventing civil procedure for international mm -hmm. transactions. No, I think that's a good observation. And, and a nice segue also to my next question, um, which is what do you see in the future of international arbitration, particularly international commercial arbitration? Well, somebody like Yogi Berra, although I don't think it was Yogi Berra, <laughs> said that prediction is always difficult, particularly about the future. Um, <laughs> I think that there are some, some themes in arbitration that are going to be around for quite a while. One of them is the notion of an arbitrator's jurisdiction, 
which mm -hmm. basically has to do with allocating tasks between the courts and the arbitrators. When does a question fall uh, in the merits of the dispute to be decided by the arbitral tribunal? When is it a question of jurisdiction that might be given to a reviewing court? Um, another question, of course, is ethics that's going to be around for a <laughs> long time because there are two surefire ways to destroy international arbitration. One is to have ethical rules that are too lax, so you have pernicious arbitrators. The other is to have ethical rules that go awry so that the arbitrators can get challenged and removed without good cause, and then you have precarious arbitrators. So that's going to be a theme that's around for quite a while. I think that the theme of efficiency is going to be around for some time, balancing due process against saving time and cost, against getting an accurate result, against getting an enforceable award. Um, I think that with respect to investor state disputes, which is something that's on everybody's mind now, particularly since uh, the U.S. and I see Mark Cantor there, he will confirm that I think the U.S. is now, at least uh, President -elect Trump has announced that he will pull out of the TPP negotiations. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah. All right. So we're going to have a lot of talk about that. And with respect to investor state, I do have the sense that there are cycles. I, I think it's a little bit like <clears throat> uh, uh, ladies' fashions, you know, dresses go up and down. And uh, they, they, what we had before comes back. If you look at investor state arbitration, back in the late 1800s, you had Carlos Calvo, and a great Argentine jurist, who set forth the so-called Calvo Doctrine, which said that one should not arbitrate investor state disputes. And that held sway throughout much of Latin America for years. And then you had a revival of that in the 1970s with something called the New International Economic Order, the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. Uh, and then you had people who said, wait a minute, this view that all investment disputes have to go before local courts is starting to chill uh, economically productive cross-border investment. And so you had a wave of bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements. Now, the arbitration under those agreements is being called into question, quite understandable, because if you're a host state, um, you probably would, in all cases, want to have uh, disputes decided by local courts. And the uh, investment arbitration is a little bit like imposing the discipline of a Fifth Amendment takings clause on international investment. You don't take without compensation or imposing a due process clause. So I think that we'll have uh, cycles, we'll have going up and down, uh, but I, I don't see uh, any of the uh, types of arbitration we have now as going away, whether it's construction, insurance, oil and gas, investor state. I think that they will continue because they do provide a relatively level playing field. No playing field is completely level, but some are less level than others. Okay, so let me just ask a quick follow-up question on the investment arbitration issue, because there have been no longer just proposals, but actually activities to construct what's being called an investment arbitration, uh, excuse me, an, uh, an international investment court. Uh, so as part of your uh, ups and downs in investment arbitration, do you see that as taking hold and becoming a sort of robust alternative to investment arbitration? I have to admit agnosticism on that. I think there are people <laughs> in this room who are more informed than I am okay. on how the court would work. And uh, maybe when we're done, we could ask some of the people in this room. I, okay. uh, I would not want to put my uh, untutored views forward at this moment. OK, so unfair question. So, But with that, let me ask what I think the question for at least uh, the young professionals in the room uh, are probably sitting here hoping I will ask, and that is if you had one piece of advice uh, for law students and for young arbitration practitioners um, as they sort of contemplate their futures and make their plans, uh, one final image that I will give to uh, accompany this answer uh, is you as a young uh, new uh, lecturer in Bern uh, and early in your career in international arbitration, 
looking back, what, would you, what advice would you give uh, young Rusty or others uh, in the room here about making a career in international arbitration? Um, I would say expect the unexpected. Uh, you're not usually going to end up where you thought you would end up. You may start out wanting to be a tax lawyer and end up being an arbitration lawyer. You may start out wanting to do arbitration and end up doing securities litigation. Um, I think expecting the unexpected is very important, keeping an open mind. Okay. Well, the, the, the dilemma faced by young people coming up in the ranks, because most people, when they start out, will start out as lawyers. And it'll be much later that they get uh, a first appointment as arbitrator. And there will be a time in almost everyone's career uh, where he or she is in transition. <clears throat> um, and that's what we want. We want people who have experience uh, serving as lawyers when they're younger, who know something about how the system works, later on to be able to serve as an arbitrator. And there is this uh, 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 a, a gray period when they're transitioning from one to the other that's not going to be easy to deal with in ethical rules. In many instances, I alluded this to earlier, is I published something which later on seemed overly simplistic. I look back at my early law review articles, which were on international tax in the Columbia Law Review, the Cornell Law Review, and when I read them, I think, boy, that stuff was just uh, silly. Uh, when, when you're starting out your career, you want to make a splash. You want to say something earth-shattering, and as a result, often you say things that are silly. So I don't think that I've ever uh, embarrassed myself in the sense of taking inconsistent positions, if that's what you're talking about. But I, I've certainly embarrassed myself by writing things when younger that later on seem not to have delved deeply enough into the problems. Um, and the, uh, the, the further I go, uh, uh, the more admiring I am of scholarship that takes a narrow question to look at. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, American legal scholarship is just the opposite. Some young person will be told, well, you should write about fairness. And so there's a 400-page law review article on fairness or something like that. And of course, the word means different things in different contexts. One might be able to write about fairness in the context of the ICSID rules or fairness in the context of the ICC rules but not fairness in general. Often when people think of transparency, they think of having investor state uh, proceedings open to the public. And that does sometimes happen. Uh, my own experience has been that often uh, the people who are interested in what's occurring show up the first day, and then they realize that it's rather boring, and they don't show up the second or the third day. You know, they're listening to uh, economic experts talk about discounted cash flows and that sort of thing. Um, with respect to the LCIA project, what we did a few years ago was to take the challenge decisions, the decisions in which arbitrators were challenged, and we published them in a sanitized version. And there is an issue of Arbitration International which has a wonderful introduction to it by two very bright uh, young lawyers, Ruth Teitelbaum and Tom Walsh, who are both in New York. And they looked at all of these uh, cases, and uh, Ruth Teitelbaum and Tom Walsh uh, did a wonderful uh, guide to these various uh, challenge decisions. Some of them make very good reading. Uh, there's a, a famous one about an arbitrator who was removed because over lunch, someone took his grapes. He had grapes for dessert. And when he came back to his retiring room, after having gone to the, the restroom, he found his grapes were gone. And he knew it was the lawyer for the claimants who had taken his grapes. <laughs> and uh, immediately uh, created somewhat of a conflict. Uh, so it, it, reading through these stories is interesting, and it's also uh, a set of cautionary tales as what not to do. If your grapes are missing, let it pass. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So no sour grapes. I think with that, uh, that is going to bring us to the end of the Catherine and Rusty show. Uh, thank you very much. And let's all please thank Rusty for his wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, thank you.